Thank you so much for coming out on another notoriously cold evening to our lovely orchestra hall. You'll see in the program tonight that the order of the pieces are listed as Flatermaus, the cello concerto, um, then Manfred Overture, and then Rosenkavalier Suite. But we've made a slight change, and instead this evening, we're going to pair the Schumanns together in the first half, Manfred and the cello concerto, and then Rosenkavalier, and we'll finish with Flatermaus Overture. When our conductor, Nikolai uh, Zepp Snyder, we were talking about the program, and he mentioned how going from Manfred, which is very, very tragic, to Rosenkavalier, which is quite happy, it's too much of a contrast. And that's just one of the things that the conductors, when they come to the DSO, have to consider. How do these pieces with incredibly intense emotional results pair with each other or contrast with each other? And so he and the DSO have made the decision to pair Schumann and then to pair, really, the Austrian waltzes together in the second half. What's so intimidating about the Manfred Overture is really, like I mentioned, how tragic it is. And this comes from a composer, Robert Schumann, who lived an entirely tragic life. As early as 1830, he was overcome with intense mental disorders. He would have these fits of visions that were either angelic and lovely or incredibly demonic and terrifying. And so later in life, he was very drawn to these very dark stories like Manfred and eventually more Faustian, literally Faustian stories. But Schumann didn't start as a composer. He actually started in law school. He had entirely planned on being a lawyer until one day he told his family, I'm going to be a pianist, which of course I'm sure they were so pleased about what parent wouldn't be. <laughs> Just kidding. Make sure that your kids do music. <laughs> um, and so he started to train to become a world-class pianist. And in fact, he was on that path. He was going to be one of the most excellent pianists in the world. But a hand injury resulted in him having to stop performing. And so instead, he really focused on composing. He composed a lot for the piano and eventually more chamber music and four symphonies and then one of his crowning achievements, which is the Manfred Overture. When he started composing this piece, he had read Lord Byron's play. So Lord Byron had written this play, or it's not really a play, it was kind of turned into a play, but it's more of an epic poem, in 1816 in England. And at this time, England was in love with ghost stories. They loved elements of the supernatural. And Byron put it in his poem, and Schumann put it in his incidental work. And when I say incidental work, what I mean is music that accompanies a play, as opposed to a zingspiel, like Flatermouse, which is music accompanied by text. So you could argue that that was just a way of the French to distinguish themselves from the Germans or so forth, but we'll get to Flatermouse later. So what survived and most popular from the Manfred set is the overture. After the overture, there are 15 more pieces of music, including a entre -acte, numbers with choir, numbers with soloists, melodrama numbers, but really it's the overture that has continued to be prevalent in concert halls. When we're playing it tonight, I want you to keep an eye out for any time that you'll hear three notes together. And Nikolai, our conductor, commented during rehearsals that all of these German composers after Beethoven could never escape that three-note set. Da, 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 da. Sound familiar? Did anyone come last week when we did Beethoven 5? Yes, exactly. And just like for Manfred, and in Beethoven 5, it's that fate motif, that sound like something larger than you is taking control of your life. So who is Manfred? Manfred is a Faustian noble who actually has relations to spellcasting and to spirits. And for whatever reason, he feels extreme guilt for the loss of the love of his life, Astarte. If anyone's read The Count of Monte Cristo, Edmond Dantes and Manfred are much the same. They have this secret, secret background that they don't really want anyone to know about, and they do everything they can to try to win back their love. And in the case of Edmond Dantes, of course, he has to remain in the corporeal world where he can't cast spells. But for Manfred, he does everything he can to try to get his love back. 
And so the spirits with whom he communicates say, there's nothing we can do about the past. She's gone. And so Manfred's one thing that he can do is to say, no heaven for me, no hell for me, just death. It's incredibly tragic. What makes elements of this so tragic is the constant agitation that you'll hear in the orchestra. The main theme, so if you have a pulse, da, 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 the theme constantly occurs off the pulse. So how about this side? Go, da, 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 da. Okay, and what we're gonna do is when they go da, we're gonna go off them. So it's gonna go da, 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 da. Okay? So you guys have off beats, you guys have on beats, okay? One, two, three, four. Come on, you guys gotta do better. I'll sing with you guys, okay? One, two, three, four. Da, 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 da. See how that's kind of uncomfortable? Yeah? That's the theme, and it's agitated, and it's kind of painful. And that's something that Schumann does to really make sure that we know that this isn't da 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 or something more lovely, you know, something more classical. Because Schumann really is a romantic composer, a 19th century romantic composer. Towards the end of the overture, you're going to hear a chorale, a sudden chorale, which in the incidental music comes back towards the end of the piece. There's a melody happening in the violins, but then pay attention to the brass. Because it's in this moment where that's more of a religious statement by Schumann. And it's that part of the story where he says, no heaven, no hell, I choose to die. In the play by Lord Byron, he says to the abbot, eventually when he goes to a church to, to discuss all of this, oh my old man, tis not so hard to die. And unfortunately, I, I think we all know that Schumann really felt the same. In 1854, in February of that year, he tried to commit suicide by jumping in a river, in the Rhine. And he told Clara, Clara Schumann, his wife, um, that he was worried he was gonna hurt her, he was worried he was gonna hurt himself. And so for the last two and a half years of his life, he remained in an insane asylum. He was not comfortable, it was very sad but we have all the music that he wrote during his lifetime, which takes us to the next piece, the cello concerto. Now this was a work that he actually never heard performed. It was four years after his death that it eventually had its premiere, and it now sits in the cello concerto canon next to Dvorak concerto, Elgar concerto, Shostakovich concerto. However, it's heavily contrasting with those works. You'll see tonight that the concerto runs without pause. There are no spaces in between the movements. They run one right after the other. The um, string concerto that comes to mind when you think who else was doing this type of thing, uh, in 1844, Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto, the final two movements go with Taka. But this was more of a class, uh, late Baroque tendency. Some Vivaldi concertos and some Bach concertos also have movements that run one right into the other. The other thing that really sets it apart from the other concertos is that it's not necessarily virtuosic. Musically, with phrasing and intent and overall translation of subject matter, it's incredibly difficult. But there are only a few sections where there are double stops or running passages, especially compared with Dvorak and Shostakovich, it's not nearly as technically challenging. Which some people at the time criticized um, the piece at the premiere, but now come to revere it because it's these, these, these elements that make it stand apart that make it so special. The other thing that's so special, like I mentioned before, Schumann was married to Clara. And for Schumann, music was always two things. It was always the higher power to poetry, and it was always a diary. And so if you ever want to know what's going on in Sibelius' life, read his literal diaries. If you want to know what's going on in Schumann's life, pay attention to the music he's writing at that time. In many pieces that he wrote after marrying Clara, she was depicted as a descending fifth. And so any time that you hear that, it means that Clara is somewhere 
in the orchestra. And in the second movement, you'll know it's the second movement because there will be a drastic character change. The first movement is incredibly active, starts in A minor. The second movement suddenly slows down, and the strings begin an accompagnato of pizzicato notes. And it's a completely different color and atmosphere change, and we move to a major key. And what's going to happen is our cello concerto soloist, Jean Guillen, plays here and actually begins a duet with our principal cellist, Wei Yu. And music theorists, musicologists, they love to say that in this moment, especially with the theme beginning and being characterized with the descending fifth, is Schumann's way of showing Clara communicating with him. It's their special love duet. I know I love it too. So cute. And it ends absolutely brilliantly, and our soloist is absolutely stunning. I believe his biography is in the program, and you can take a look at that, but really how he plays is just on a completely no different level. So that'll be the first half. We're going to start tragic, we're going to stay with Schumann, and then we'll have an intermission. After intermission comes one of the best pieces ever written. I love this piece. I love the opera too. So this is a big distinction that I want to make right now between Manfred, Rosenkavalier, and um, Fledermaus. Manfred comes from incidental music, which is text that becomes accompanied by music. Rosenkavalier is a full opera. Um, and then Fledermaus is a Zingspiel, which, like the magic flute by Mozart, there's music, which is a high priority, and then there's text to fill in some of the um, plot, necessary plot information. So Rosen Cavalier came at a time in Richard Strauss's life where he had just written two operas that were absolutely revolutionary, Electra and Zalame. And his contemporaries thought, what could possibly be next? Strauss had collaborated with um, Hoffmannsthal, which was, who was his librettist, for six operas. And each time, it was the perfect unification of text, action, and music. Incredibly successful operas. And it's not that Rosen Cavalier is not also incredibly successful and wonderful, it's just that it didn't push tonal and musical and compositional modernism as far as Electra and Zalame did. Some people consider Rosen Cavalier a step back in compositional creativity, which it is not, and here's why. Rosen Cavalier has, wait, has anyone ever seen The, Ma the Marriage of Figaro? Wonderful. So in, in Marriage of Figaro, in these comic operas, there's always some prank that's happening. There's always a couple in love and they always want to prank somebody else who's being, um, when you're not committed, infidelity, but what's that word? When you're not being, huh? Faithful. faithful, yes, thanks. So when you have a spouse who's not being faithful in opera, you prank them, you don't divorce them. And so that's kind of what happens in Flater Mouse, but for Rosen Cavalier, you start the opera with a very, erotic scene. And so the marshalin, who is an older woman, she's called that because she's married to the field marshal, the marshalin, is having an affair with a young boy, Octavian. And right from the beginning, you're going to hear in our horn section um, a climax of sort. <laughs> they didn't prepare me to how to explain this. <laughs> And it's because this opera opens in a more tonally accessible major key. So compared to Electra and Zalame before, completely different atmosphere. However, it's revolutionary because it's sh showing noble characters behaving in nobly. And the same thing happens in The Marriage of Figaro, where you have the Count and the Countess, who are supposed to be so highbrow, getting duped all the time by their servants and getting tricked. And so how the suite came to be the 1945 version, was Strauss just said, okay, you can make a suite. And so it's not exactly known who arranged this suite. Some people think that Strauss told Eugene Ormandy exactly what to cut, and then somebody just 
created material for the very, very end. So everything you're going to hear through the suite is directly from the opera, except the last 24 bars of music. That's newly composed, but uses themes from the rest of the opera. Another major character in Der Rosenkavalier is Baron von Ox. And Ox in German literally means ox, like the animal. They're clumsy, they're stupid, and so is he. He goes to the Marshallin's room at the start of the opera because he's engaged to this young, beautiful girl, and he needs somebody to bear a rose to her. So hence, the Rosen Cavalier is the rose giver. And so the very first contrasting moment of music that you're going to hear, it's very, very loud and very exciting, and then you're going to hear this theme that happens over and over in the harps and the violins, and that's always the rose duet theme. So what happens in the opera at the start of the second act is Octavian goes to bear this rose, and of course, what happens, these two young people, they see each other and they fall in love instantly. And the Marshallin, she knew that was going to happen. So one element of the Marshallin as a character is she knows she's older, she knows that her young fling is eventually going to leave her for someone younger, more beautiful, but he swears at the time, no, 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 you're the only one for me. I'm going to be with you forever. But she knows better. And so one thing she tries to do is stop time. And she can't. After they see each other, the two young, the two young characters, the marshal realizes what's going to happen. But the problem is, that young girl, she's supposed to marry Baron von Ox. And so they have to trick him to make sure this wedding doesn't take place. And through a whole series of events that take him to an inn, and he flirts with different maids, and then he's discovered to, being, to, to, to have the propensity to be unfaithful, the engagement's called off. Okay. And the opera ends in one of the best trios ever written. The Marshallin and the two young characters sing a trio where the Marshallin more sings to the audience and the other two more sing to each other. She accepts what's happening and they're convinced they're going to be in love forever. However, just to point out, the Marshallin and her husband were once young as well. Same with the Counts and Countess from Figaro. So who knows what's actually going to happen to them. And Strauss leaves little elements of that. That's one of the things he tries to hammer home in that story is, we all start out like that, but most of us also end up like the Marshallin, or in Mozart's case, like the Count and the Countess. The orchestration for Rosen Cavalier is massive. And Strauss was an absolute genius when it comes to composition. His father was the horn player in the Vienna, in the Vienna Staatsoper Orchestra for most of his life. Does anyone know the story of how Richard Strauss became engaged to his wife, Pauline? This is one of my favorites, okay. Strauss wasn't only an incredible composer, he was an incredible conductor. He was at the Staatsoper in Vienna. They were working on one of his operas, and Pauline was a soprano, a diva diva soprano, and she was on stage singing. And things aren't going so well. The tenor who sang before her was frustrating. The orchestra was getting frustrated. She was getting frustrated. Strauss was trying to keep everything together. And suddenly, she stops the whole rehearsal. She stops everything and says, that's it. I can't work with this orchestra. They sound terrible. You're not doing a good job. I'm done. And she goes to her dressing room. And Richard Strauss says to the orchestra, ladies and gentlemen, please wait here and he goes to talk to her. So of course, all the principals get up and run to the door, and they're listening at the door, and they hear glass breaking and things smashing, her screaming, and suddenly it goes quiet. And Strauss comes out of the dressing room, and they say, Maestro, what are you going to do? You have to reprimand her in some way. We cannot work with someone like that. And he said, well, that's too bad, because I'm going to marry her. Strauss said of his own compositional style, he was a very, he was a very humorous man, but he had, he had a great insight into how he composed. And so he said, cherries do not blossom in the winter, nor do musical ideas come readily when nature is bleak and cold. I am a great lover of nature, 
Hence, it is natural that I do my best creative work in the autumn and then write out and polish the detailed scores in the winter. One of the most important melodies from my opera, Der Rosenkavalier, struck me while I was playing a Bavarian card game. But before I improvise even the smallest sketch for, the, for an opera, I allow the text to permeate my thoughts and mature in me at least six months or so, so that the situation and characters may be thoroughly assimilated. Then, only, do I let musical thoughts enter my mind. The sub-sketches then become sketches. They are copied out. This is the hard part of the work. I have long since learned that in my composition, I am unable to write without a program to guide me. What's funny is that was later published on his 72nd birthday in New York. And in a, and in a response letter, he said, whoever, this, whoever said this is an absolute idiot. <laughs> so that, that leads us to our final piece. But before we talk about Der Fledermaus, Rosen Cavalier encompasses Mozart, Verdi, Wagner, and, jo and Johann Strauss Sr. and Jr. You're going to hear a lot of waltzes in Rosen Cavalier. If you ever one day hear the full opera, you'll hear a full bel canto style Italian aria in the first act. And not necessarily light motifs like Wagner uses, but there's constant thematic material that happens in the voices and in the orchestra within the opera that tell you what's happening, what's going to happen, and what happened. It's a synthesis of all musical history behind it. It's more of a peak than a step back in compositional style. Fledermaus comes much before Rosenkavalier. I think in your programs, there's a lovely diagram that shows you how each composer falls in music history. Fledermaus is also one of those operatic stories where infidelity occurs and pranks happen. So it's called the bat, because the original prank that conjured, triggered, illuminated the entire story was when one guy gets his buddy so drunk, he's wearing a bat costume, and he leaves him in the street, and the next morning pretty much has to walk of shame home in a bat costume. That's pretty much the synopsis of the, of the story. Then, a few years later, he gets his revenge by orchestrating this big party where people show up in different costumes, so all of their friends, nobody knows who's, who the other person is. And even the moments that are supposed to be serious are funny. Even the moments that are supposed to be, oh, I love you so much, I'm going to miss you, it's all sarcastic. Every note of Johann Strauss Jr.'s Fledermaus is like champagne bubbles. And what I mean is that the culmination of this opera story, where the main character thinks he's flirting with some beautiful woman, that beautiful woman turns out to be his actual wife. And so at the time, she knows it's him and takes his watch from him during the party. And then later at the end of the show, she says, look, it was me. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, don't divorce me. And the way he gets out of it is he says to his wife, it was the champagne. And she says, you're right. You would never do this if you were sober. And so it has a happy ending, and it's totally fine. In the overture, it's one of the most often performed works in Vienna. It's part of New Year's concerts very often. It's absolutely hysterical. Every note is sarcastic. Every note is, like I said, champagne. It's not wine. It's not, it's not coffee. It's champagne bubbles. When you're in, inside the overture, you'll hear ser more serious music. Think of it sarcastically, because it's not, it's not actually happening that way in the opera. It's also an incredibly difficult piece to conduct. It's constantly on conducting competitions. It's, it has a lot of tempo changes, sudden meter changes, character changes, mood changes. It's, it's very sudden. But our conductor is absolutely stunning, and so is the orchestra, and they execute all of this flawlessly. So once again, the program for tonight will be Manfred, Cello Concerto, Intermission, Rosenkavalier, Fledermaus. So I only have a couple more minutes with everyone. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Can you just introduce yourself to the audience? <laughs> she asked if I could introduce myself. Yes. I always forget this. This happens every time. I am Chelsea Gallo. I am the cover conductor here at the Detroit Symphony. 
and I am finishing up my orchestral conducting degree at the University of Michigan. Normally people say go blue. <laughs> I know there are a couple faculty here from UM, so. Are there any other questions? There are three common Strausses. There's the dad of Johann Strauss, there's Johann Strauss Jr., and then there's Richard Strauss. There's absolutely zero relationship between Richard Strauss and the other two Strausses. Strauss I. <laughs> but Johann Strauss Sr. Is, is credited a lot with um, pretty much educating his son and then also dictating how he would compose waltzes in much the same way. One other factor that I would like to point out is that waltzes are not all the same. There are English waltzes, there are French, waltz, French waltzes, and there are Austrian Viennese waltzes. And you're gonna hear tonight music in three. Bum, 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 bum. But in a Viennese waltz, sometimes what happens is the second beat comes sooner and the third beat comes later. And it's all because of how the Viennese danced their particular waltzes. And at this point, I'm gonna have you all stand up and we're gonna to learn to waltz. <laughs> I'm never coming back to the DSO again. No. Um, and so pay attention for when we're playing straight waltzes, bump, 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 or when we're going bump, 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 bump. Okay, it's an, it's an, it's an oral, oral game for you all to play. Okay, any more questions? Okay, enjoy the show, everyone. Thank you.